Well, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's my time now. Why are you laughing about that? <laughs> it's really good to have you this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, it's our honor to worship Jesus with you. Uh, our purpose here is not for show or display. It is to make much of the one who's worthy to be honored and glorified. And so I'm so delighted that you're here in a part of uh, the celebration as we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to the book of Ezekiel. Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, we're going to look and talk about the resurrection as it uh, has its seed planted firmly in the Old Testament. 1963, a group of archaeologists were uh, exploring and uncovering uh, in Masada sifting through the rubble of uh, Herod's palace, his palatial palace there that overlooks the Dead Sea. Uh, in 1963, they found many archaeological uh, artifacts, but maybe the most uh, intriguing of all those artifacts was a little jar, a little jar with, I think it was seven seeds in that jar. Uh, they dated that jar from somewhere between 1955, that is BC, to somewhere around 64 AD. Uh, we don't know exactly, but somewhere in that span. So what we're talking about is a jar of seeds that were 2,000 years old. Scientists took that seed, one of those seeds, and planted it in the ground in 2005. And guess what happened? Life sprang up. An amazing event. The, uh, the date palm uh, located there in, 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 in that, that region of the world, that date palm lie dormant for 2,000 years, but that seed planted in the ground birthed life. This morning I want to tell you that 2,000 years ago, a seed went into the ground. And that seed didn't spend 2,000 years in the ground, but it spent three days in the ground. And on the third day, life came from death. And this morning, we are here to celebrate that singular event, the event that changed everything in world history. I want to propose to you this morning, there is not a more significant historical event that has ever occurred than the event that Jesus stood up on the third day, and he walked out of that grave, and he lives to this day, and that's why you're here, and that's why we're here to celebrate. This morning, if you have your notes in, in your bulletin, here's what I would invite you to write. The story of Easter reminds us of the gravity of God's judgment. Of the gravity of God's judgment. Ezekiel chapter 37, read with me there, verses 1 and 2. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. And it was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. When you see this picture... There's a couple of things that you need to remember. Uh, number one, Ezekiel is an Old Testament prophet, okay? That means that when God had something going on with his people, what he would do was send his prophet as a spokesman. And his prophet served as a kind of a, a mouthpiece for God. So when God wanted to communicate a message to his people, he would send a spokesman out. And usually when God sent a message to his people, well, it usually wasn't a positive message. You know what it meant? 
it, well, it meant that they had blown it, okay? It, it, I, I go back to my childhood, and usually when my mom summoned me <laughs> because the teacher had called, usually that message wasn't a positive message. Well, the people of God who were in covenant relationship with God, they had violated our broken covenant. And that broken covenant, that breach in relationship between God and His people had had devastating consequences. And the devastating consequences is shown here in this text in visual form. What Ezekiel saw was the consequence of their sin. Let me spell it out for you very clearly, church. Listen to me. The consequences of of sin is death. New Testament says it this way, for the wages of sin is what? Is death. And so as Ezekiel takes this scene in, he looks at what used to be, and he has to talk about the people of God, not in present tense, but in past tense. What they used to be. This used to be a mighty people. This used to be a great army, but because of sin, because of the effects of the fall, judgment had come upon the people, and it had wreaked havoc among the people of God. R.C. Sproul, and I don't have this on the board, but R.C. Sproul in his great book, The Truth of the Cross, said this, if anything has been lost from our culture... It is the idea that human beings are privately, personally, individually, ultimately, inexorably accountable to God for their lives. Look at me this morning. You may not like accountability. You may not like your boss telling you what to do, all right? Youth, children, you may not like your parents telling you what to do. You, you may not like the government telling you what to do. Husbands, you may not. Well, let me stop right there. <laughs> the truth is, no one really likes accountability. We all have a certain allergy to accountability, but every single person in this room and every single person outside of this room stands accountable to a holy God. Story of Easter is inextricably linked to that. You stand accountable. God who is holy and God who is sovereign will one day call you and me and everyone into account. And Ezekiel stands there and he notices that judgment, well, that judgment is a reality. And you say, well, why, why is this? Why is sin such a big deal? And the answer is, sin is a big deal and should be a big deal to us because it's a really big deal to God. And the reason it's a big deal to God is because God is holy. Can you say that word with me? Holy, all right? Wages of sin is death. That, that is the judgment of sin is death because God is a holy God. The book of Ezekiel just drips with that message that God is a holy God. In fact, Ezekiel strives and points us and reminds us that God is not a God like all the other world gods. Our God is set apart He's in a class and a category that is distinct and all by himself. Our God is a holy God. If you look back in Ezekiel chapter 36, you see this underscored. Uh, verse, or chapter 36, verses 22 and 23 says this, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord." declares the Lord God, 
when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. You need to know this morning that God is a holy God. Uh, there, there is... There's a great misnomer in our culture that God's just the man upstairs. He's just our buddy, our friend, our chum. But I want to tell you unequivocally that Scripture says that God is holy. And when you and I come to terms with what God says about Himself, not your opinion or my opinion, but God's opinion of Himself, and God declares that He is a holy God unlike any other gods. When you come to Ezekiel chapter 37 and you see death, it reminds us that we will be accountable to God and that His judgment, His judgment is frightening. You say, what does that have to do, Brother Chad, with the Easter story? I, I, I don't know if I'm connecting the dots here. It, it was, am I wrong on my calendar? I thought this was about the resurrection and you're telling us about the death. But church, I want you to know you cannot understand the empty tomb rightly without the backdrop of the cross. You see, the cross gives meaning to the empty tomb. And what does the cross tell us? Look, look at me. The cross tells us that the wages of sin is what? Is death. Well, well didn't that pose a problem? I thought Jesus never sinned. And the answer is yes, he never sinned. But Jesus doesn't go to the cross bearing his judgment. Look at me. He goes to the cross bearing your judgment and my judgment. Jesus is the quintessential substitute. I, I don't know, uh, some of you can remember back in the days of school when you would go to school and your teacher wasn't there and you had a substitute. You know what we called that? Party day at school, right? And that poor substitute teacher. I, I, you know, I still need to go back to some of them and repent uh, for my behavior. But I think God has a way of, uh, you know, kind of bringing things full circle because now I get to be the dugout dad in my eight-year-old's ball team. I think it's kind of the same thing. Where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. Jesus... Jesus did not go to the cross bearing his sin and guilt. He went to the cross as the singular exception in all human history, as the only one who never sinned. And yet he stands on the cross and he lays down his life and he faces the wrath of God poured out on him. And he does that not because of what he had done. Friend, look at me this morning. Jesus bore your sin, your guilt, and your judgment. And that's what the text is teaching us here. The, the picture of judgment in the Old Testament points us forward to a day of judgment. And the great day of judgment for the people of God falls on Good Friday. And thankfully, I'm so thankful, it didn't fall on this preacher. It fell on his Savior. Judgment fell on Jesus so that judgment wouldn't fall on you or me. The story of Easter, the story of Easter reminds us of the gravity of God's judgment. Have you ever wondered, I mean, just literally, have you ever wondered why it is that Jesus is breaking out in sweat so great that his capillaries begin to rupture and blood mingles in with his sweat when he's out in the garden facing the cross on the next day. Well, we've got documented st stories of martyrs that go to their death singing and praising. Why is Jesus breaking out in bloody sweat and the martyrs are singing going to their death? And I want to submit to you this morning that Jesus was not fearing death so much as it was the wrath of God that he was dreading. What Jesus faced on Good Friday was the judgment of God poured full strength into what he 
experienced. And the good news is, he drank the cup of God's wrath so that you and I might avoid the wrath of God. Let's move on very quickly. Not only we see the Easter story reminds us of the gravity of judgment, but the story of Easter reminds us that we all must answer life's most pressing question. We must all answer life's most pressing question. If you've got kids at the house, one thing you know about children is they like to ask questions. They like to ask questions a lot. Sometimes I don't have the answers to those questions. And when I don't have the answer to those questions, and Jace, he'll just pepper me. Sometimes with theological questions about the Trinity and other doctrinal truths of the faith. And you know what I say, go ask your mom, son. (laughs) (sighs) Questions are kind of in human nature. But when you come to this text in Ezekiel, this prophet who lived some 600 years before the birth of Christ, he's taken out and he's shown death and he's shown judgment. And he's asked a probing question, and it's a question that relates to this Sunday, and it's a question that relates to you and me. In fact, just listen to it this morning, this, this, this pressing, probing question, Ezekiel 37, verse 3. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I submit to you this morning that that is a fundamental question. It's a question you must answer this morning, and it's a question I must answer. Sometimes everything we believe can be reduced down to just one simple question. Can these bones live? You know, God is is the master at asking just the right question at just the right time. You see that tracked out through the story uh, of the Bible in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Adam and Eve had been in perfect relationship with God. And because of their rebellion, when they ate the fruit, they found out they were naked. They went and hid themselves, covering themselves, and God's presence comes walking through the garden. And in just that one moment... God asked a question, Adam, where are you? Now, at that point, church, we need to step back and observe something. Doesn't God know everything? And the answer is, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh, right? God knows everything. Does he know where Adam is? That question wasn't for God's information. God already knew the answer. God asked that question for Adam's benefit. Adam needed to think and process where he was. Sometimes God asks just the right question at just the right moment. Maybe you find yourself here in this this room. Maybe, Maybe your relationship to God has been more hit and miss. Maybe, maybe your commitment to Christ is is not. Not really characteristic of how you live your life on an everyday basis. And this morning, God is whispering in your ear, where are you? Where are you? Pressing question. God pressed the button here in Ezekiel's day, and it really takes us forward into the New Testament times. And maybe in Sunday school, you talked about uh, the, the, the story of one of Jesus' buddies, uh, a buddy of Jesus that died, and, and he came back to life. In, in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 11, we're told about Lazarus and Martha, his sister, and Jesus coming to the graveside of Lazarus some four days after death. Now, that's significant, because what we know is that the Scripture teaches that God acts on the third day. The Jewish people had this belief that that somehow the Spirit kind of lingered around the body for three days. 
And after that, the spirit would depart, and there would be no hope after that point. And so when does, when does Jesus show up? Look, Jesus shows up after hope has left the building. And he walks up, and he makes some radical declaration in front of the people. And he says this, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And that's shocking news, isn't it? That's good news on that day. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she's pointing forward. She's thinking in the distant future on resurrection day, then he will rise again. And Jesus is just about to tell her that whenever he shows up, it is resurrection day, by the way. He's going to tell her that. Notice what he says in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Is that not a glorious truth this morning? I mean, we gather in this room, and we gather because we believe that that, true, that, that statement is not just information. It's fact. It's a fact of history that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And then he asked Martha a probing question. Like God asked Adam in the garden. Like God asked Ezekiel in the valley. He asked a probing question, a question I want to probe you with this morning. Listen to his question. Do you believe this? I read a study done by the British Broadcasting Company back in 2017, uh, written, uh, I think, in February of 2017. They surveyed Christians, people who profess faith in Jesus Christ, thousands of Christians. And the survey went like this. They asked these believers what they believed about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A pretty simple, straightforward answer. Believers believe the resurrection, right? Well, they found, get this, the BBC found that one quarter of people who described themselves as Christians in Great Britain now do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought of that? How you can be an unbelieving believer? Does that sound contradictory to you? Just say, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. It is a flat contradiction. Listen to me. Listen to me. If Jesus Christ is dead, there is no reason for us to be Christian. Does that make sense to you this morning? The only reason I believe in Jesus is because I believe on the third day he stood up and he walked out of that grave. Anything else is just unjustifiable, unthinkable. And so the question lingers in the air and it echoes and it reverberates in Ezekiel's mind. Can these bones live? Thomas Jefferson One of our great fathers, founder, uh, uh, writer, author of the Declaration of Independence, a mind that is brilliant and birthed much of our democracy. Jefferson was strong on religious freedom and not having government impose itself in democracy and our freedom of expression as it relates to our religion. But Jefferson was not a believer in Jesus Christ in the sense of the the Scriptures. Jefferson took a Bible, and what he did was he took a, a little knife, and very meticulously and very thoughtfully, he cut out every reference to the miraculous in the Bible. Jefferson edited out everything. In fact, The story that Jefferson leaves us with is a story that Jesus' body is put in the tomb and they walk away. And the curtain closes on the story of Jesus. And this morning, 
There are so many people who have that view of Jesus, that he was a good man, that he was a great prophet, that he had lots of followers, but there was nothing more to the story than just those things. And I want to ask you a question. When they put Jesus in that grave on Friday, can these bones live? Can these bones live? Do you believe that? In fact, in these questions, I I want you to think about this. Do I believe, in, in your notes, do I believe that the story of Jesus ends at the grave? Not, not, does, not, not does Pastor Chad believe that? Not does my neighbor believe that? Not, not, not does, did Billy Graham believe that? Or the Pope or anybody else? Do I believe that the story of Jesus ends at the grave? Here's the next question I want you to ponder. Does your belief about Jesus change the way you live? What we know about the followers of Jesus Christ is that they embrace that story that Jesus lived a perfect life. He died on a Roman cross, was placed in a borrowed tomb, and three days later, breath re-entered his lungs. He stood up and he walked out and he lives. And they believe that story, every one of them to a man. And they believed it with such conviction that they went out and proclaimed it to the ends of the earth. And all of them, except for John, all of them died a martyr's death because they were so convinced and so convicted that Jesus Christ is alive. This morning, I submit to you that once the seed of faith in Christ sinks in and takes root in your life, it produces fruit in your life. It changes things. I'll tell you my story real quick. I grew up as a uh, Baptist preacher's grandson, lived next door to the church, loved going to church, loved to sing and, and do all the church things. But for years in my life, I knew the gospel intellectually. I knew the facts of Christianity. But I'd never made a personal faith commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, I want to tell you, when I committed my life to Jesus in faith, turning from my sin and trusting Jesus, the gospel took root in my soul. And that root produced a different way of life. You know what happened? Ever since I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I never had to have my mom and dad say, you know what, Chad? Get up and go to church. I'm married now. Christy does that. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, you know what? Because the the gospel took root in my soul. The fruit of that was I wanted to be with God. I wanted to be with God's people. I wanted to worship Him and sing His praises. There's no place else I would rather be than in the worship of God with the people of God. This is kind of a slice of eternity. And so what you see is that real real relationship with God changes everything. And so let's move on quickly. Here it is. The story of Easter informs us, the story of Easter informs us that God opens the grave. Listen to Ezekiel real quick, because he's going to take us there and he's going to point us forward in the Old Testament to a a coming time. Here's what he says, and he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesy as I was commanded, and as I prophesy, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, 
bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, get this, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the graves, O oh, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O oh, my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel stands there, and he looks to a day that looks beyond death. A day that changes everything. A day when death gives way to life. It's a day that God promises was coming when the people would be in the grave and walk out of the grave. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that's miraculous. You got me? I mean, I mean go with me for a second. If you and I assemble the best surgical teams, the best doctors, use the best facilities and hospitals, and we take a corpse to that doctor, or those doctors, and by, by experience and medical practice, they do their magic, and guess what? Nothing happens. You know why? Because a corpse doesn't need a doctor. A corpse needs a miracle. You know what those bones needed? The supernatural intervention by a holy God. They needed the ground to shake. In fact, on Sunday morning, 2,000 years ago, we are told the ground shook, and there was a rattling of bones. And we are told that breath entered the lungs of Jesus, and he breathed, and he lived, and he walked out of that grave. And we believe that that's not just a fairy tale or a myth of history, but that is an eyewitness fact. We believe that God raises dead men. And the proof of that is that Jesus Christ is alive. I was pastoring at uh, New Brockton First Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. Had two ladies in our congregation. Uh, one of them's name was Miss Barefoot, and the other's name, I believe, was Miss Benefield. And if you know me, you know I do terrible with names. Miss Benefield passed away on a Saturday night, and I needed to announce that to the church. Miss Barefoot was seated in the congregation. And I promptly announced her departure to glory. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to recover from that. But she helped matters. Hush fell over the crowd as people looked to the right and to the left. And I'll never forget what she said. She said this, I'm not dead. <laughs> Friend, I want to tell you something. The throne of heaven is occupied by one who says, I am not dead. And you and I don't believe in myths and fairy tales. We believe in the facts of history. 
And the historical record shows that Jesus Christ was in fact very dead and came back to real life. He lived and walked among us, ascended to heaven, and one day he's coming back again. And that fact, friend, that fact should change literally everything that you and I do. The very witness of your presence here this morning bears witness to the veracity of that fact that Jesus Christ is not just a footnote of history, He's the very center of history. Friend, Jesus Christ is alive. I love what Dr. Adrian Rogers said. He said this, The resurrection is not merely important to historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. Listen to me this morning. The question that you've got to answer is, can a 2,000-year-old seed put into the ground, can it live? Can these bones live? Not does my neighbor believe that, does the preacher believe that, not does the Pope believe that, or did Billy Graham believe that? The question you must answer this morning is, do I believe that? And if I believe that, for me that must change everything. If the roots of my faith grow down, then the fruit of my faith must spring up. God is calling you, God is calling you to believe that Jesus Christ is alive. Trust your life to Him this morning. Will you bow your heads this this morning with me? Look, church, as you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to remind you that Christianity is not a a one-day-a-year event. It's an event where you commit yourself to faith in the risen Jesus and commit to following Him every day of your life. And maybe you came in this morning and God is pounding you with a probing question. Where are you? Where are you? Spiritually, relationally, where are you? Where's my standing with a holy God? Where am I? And God is probing and pressing your life with a question. And the question you need to grapple with is not only where am I, but who is He? And friend, I believe the answer is so clear. He's the living Lord that you and I need to bow our knee to, submit to, and yield ourselves up fully and completely. And Jesus stands this morning to receive you. As many as has believed in His name, to them He gave the right to become children of God. Father in heaven, in this room this morning, seated before me, are so many opportunities for people to do business with you, People to say, God, I know where I am, and where I am is not where I need to be. But by your grace, for your glory, I want to move from where I am to where you want me to be in Jesus. Father, I pray that there will be many of those personal faith commitments sweep across this room this morning. I pray that faith will be personal, not just intellectual, but in the heart. Have your will and way in this time of invitation. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. When you stand to your feet, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. And as we sing, this altar is open. You respond as we sing.